I think the last time that uh, I was in a church that it was this dark, I was visiting a, <clears throat> with someone. They asked me to go. We don't have you with us. Okay. Is it, is it on now? Good. Okay, thank, thank you much. The last time I was in a church at this, that was this dark, a friend asked me to go visit the vineyard with them, and they turned the lights down, and they put the songs up on the screen, and I felt like I should have gotten out a lighter, you know, and just sort of, <laughs> because that's what it was like. It was more of an, a, an emotional experience, really, than anything else. Um, let me start by just saying thank you to the saints at church. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. The, uh, let, let me start by saying thank you to the saints at Shorewood and, and others that have been part of putting on, on this conference. I know how hard it is and how many hours of preparation it takes, so thank you for that. We consider it a privilege to be here and uh, just an honor to spend time with all of you, so thank you for that. Let me open in a word of prayer and we'll start. Lord, thank you for your book. We thank you that you've preserved it. We thank you it's without error. We pray that this study today would glorify you. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. My assigned topic today is Revelation's seven churches and church history. And what we're going to look at is the common view that when you look at the seven churches described in Revelation 2 and 3, it's giving you an overview of how church history will play out. I have really just three simple points that I want to make today, and, and, and here are the, here's what they are. The first is what the Schofield view of Revelation 2 and 3 is. I'll talk about that in a minute. Second, why that view is wrong. Third, how you should really think about Revelation 2 and 3. So first, we'll start with what the Schofield view is. Two, we'll show why it's wrong. And then three, we'll look about at what you should really think about it. So if we could... Um, next slide, please. If, does anyone in the room have a Schofield Bible by chance? If you do, uh, turn to Revelation 1, and we're going to look at footnote 3 that Schofield has for Revelation 1, verse 20. I've put it on the screen here uh, so everyone can see it. Hopefully you can see that. What Schofield says about the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3 is that they have a fourfold application. There, there's four aspects of meaning to what's written there. First is local, to the churches actually addressed. Second, admonitory, to all churches in all time as tests by which they may discern their true spiritual state in the sight of God. Three, personal, in the exhortations to him that hath an ear and in the promise to him that overcometh. And then fourth, and, and by the way, the fourth one is the one that is, is the one we'll spend our time looking at today, prophetic. Now, you can read this, but I want to emphasize a couple things. Prophetic as disclosing seven phases of the spiritual history of the church from, say, A.D. 96 to the end. So what Schofield is really saying is that the seven different churches in Revelation 2 and 3, each one of them pertains to a different phase of the church. So that if you take the seven of them collectively, they will give you the history of what the church dispensation, so to speak, how it will play out. If you will, it's a prophecy about how, what will happen to the church through the time from A.D. 96 to the end. Schofield says, It is incredible that in a prophecy covering the church period, there should be no such foreview. These messages must contain that foreview if it is in the book at all, for the church does not appear after Revelation 3.22. Now, just notice what he's saying there. He's admitting that once you get past Revelation 3.22, the church clearly doesn't appear there. So if it's in there at all, it's got to be in Revelation 2 and 3. Notice what he then says. Again, these messages by their very terms go beyond the local assemblies mentioned. Now, notice this last, the last sentence on the page right now. Most conclusively of all, these messages do present an exact foreview of the spiritual history of the church and in this precise order. So it's an exact foreview of the history of the church, and notice they are in precise order. This page is the rest of that footnote. I give that to you just for the sake of completeness. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Let's go to the next one if we could. What I've just shown you up till now is Schofield's note in 
Revelation 1, verse 20. That's Schofield's view of what the seven churches mean. While that is Schofield's view, and I'll call that the Schofield view just for simplicity, it's a common view. Schofield is closely associated with it simply because the Schofield Reference Bible had such an impact on the thinking of the body of Christ that 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 view is associated with him. But as you can see from this chart, this is one of Clarence Larkin's charts. It has the exact same concept. Now, this may be hard to see, so I'll just call out to hear what, what I think you really need to know. If you look at this row right here, this row right here, what this has is the seven different churches listed in Revelation 2 and 3. It has Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea. And, and what will happen is if you look down here right along this row, and again, I know this is hard to see, what it's going to do is it's going to give you the history of time starting from 100 A.D. all the way out to 2000. Meaning that if you look at this, what it's saying is Ephesus here starts in first century and then goes all the way up to, here he says, about 200. And at 200 is where Smyrna starts and then it goes for a while and so on. But the point of what both Larkin and Schofield are doing is they're saying these seven churches give you these phases or eras in the history of the church. Okay? So hopefully you're with me on that. We can go ahead and, and, and turn that off and put the lights on and We'll, uh, we'll end the disco session of the, the message and, and move on from there. Why the Schofield and Larkin view, uh, my opinion, why I think it's so attractive to folks is what it does is it gives them a way to think about the history of the church and gives them a way to say, this is where we are and this is what's coming next, Right? There, there's, my observation is that man likes to find himself in prophecy. He likes to find verses and say, oh, this is about me, and this verse is being fulfilled in our day. So that, that fourth uh, of the fourfold applications that Schofield mentioned is the one that really resonates with people and that affects how the verses are perceived. Let's move to the second section of, the, of what I want to cover today. And, and the, this section, what we're going to look at is why the Schofield view is wrong. To start looking at that, let me make two observations. I want to share with you two things that are implications of the Schofield view. The first implication is this. The seven churches represent different phases of church history, which means that the churches cannot simultaneously exist, right? So in other words, he's saying these are seven different phases. So can these phases coexist? And the answer is no. Can you be in the 70s and the 80s at the same time? And the answer is no. You can't be in the 70s and 80s. You can't be in the 50s and 90s at the same time. It's the nature of a phase, right? You leave one and go into another. So the first implication of Schofield's view is that those seven different churches cannot simultaneously coexist. The second implication is this. The seven churches present the history of the church in precise spiritual, uh, uh, let me quote it, in precise order. So you go right from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamos in that exact order. So let's consider the first implication, and that is that the churches cannot simultaneously coexist. Now let let me insert one caveat. When you read the Schofield note very carefully, he hedges with the last two. So he says that they occur in precise order. He says that they're phases. He sees some overlap between Philadelphia and Laodicea. But in general, his point is these cannot coexist because they are phases that are in precise order. Look with me at Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. So when you look at at Revelation 2 and 3... It's going to describe each of these seven churches, and then it will will say some words about them. So if we look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, this is the first church. It's the church at Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, and then it says some things to the church of Ephesus. What I I want you then uh, to notice is if you go down to uh, uh, verse 7, Revelation 2, 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the what? 
church as plural. Now, when it does that in verse 7, notice what it does in verse 8. And under the angel of the church in Smyrna write, and then it's going to say some things to the church in Smyrna, but then notice verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the what? Church as plural. And what happens is if you go through Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, and you can, you can do this on your own time, I won't just to save time, but if you go to then verse 17, verse 29, in chapter 3, verses 6, 13, and 22, each time it's going to say, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto thee, and then what does it say? Churches, plural. Now think with me for a moment. If you think about what Schofield is saying, is he saying that there are seven different churches, or is he saying that there are seven phases of one church? He's saying that there's one church. Let me put the question this way. Are you in a different body of Christ than what Paul was? You're the exact same one. Because God created a body of Christ when he revealed to the Apostle Paul, and since that time, he's put everyone into the same one, right? There is one body of Christ, one church during the dispensation of grace. What Schofield is saying when he says that there are seven phases of the church, what he's really saying is it's one church that exists throughout time. It leaves the Ephesus phase and then goes into the Smyrna phase and so on. But when you look at the language of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, doesn't the very language itself tell you that it contemplates different churches existing at the same moment in time? He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church as plural. So what I would suggest to you is just the very language of Revelation 2 and 3 tells you that there's more than one church coexisting at any point in time. Now let's consider the second aspect of what Schofield was saying. What he said is that the seven churches present the history of the church in, quote, precise order. So let's consider the church at Pergamos. Get with me, if you would, Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. Revelation 2, 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. What's that a reference to? It's the second coming, isn't it? Look with me at Revelation 19. We're going to come back to Revelation 2 and 3, obviously. We'll spend a lot of time there. But notice with me Revelation 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And and just go up to verse 11 just for a moment, if you would. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. When you read Revelation 19, it's very clear that what's happening is heaven is opened, Jesus Christ is sitting on a white horse, he's going to return to the earth to take vengeance on his adversaries, and then verse 15 tells you that there's this sword that goeth out of his mouth that taketh vengeance on his adversaries. Now, my point in telling you all that is, so go back to Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2, in verse 16, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That is unmistakably the second coming. That's absolutely what it is. It's a reference to Revelation 19. So that's what Jesus Christ says to the church of Pergamos. But look with me then, and notice what he says to the church of Thyatira. Look at verse 25. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. What's that a reference to? The second coming, right? He's telling them, hold fast until I come. Get with me, Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. This is what is said to the church at Sardis. Revelation 3, 3. Remember, therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. 
If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. What in the Bible is described as coming as a thief? Yeah, look with me at, get 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2 Peter 3. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2 Peter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So we know from that verse, obviously, the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Get Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You can see what's going on there is 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Peter 3, both said that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. That's a reference to the second coming. Jesus Christ says in Revelation, I will come upon thee as a thief. So he's referring to that day of the Lord. He's referring to that second coming in what he says in Revelation 3.3. 3. Now think with me for a moment. Just help me with this here. We saw that he referenced the second coming in Revelation 2.16. He then referenced the second coming. He did that to the church of Pergamos. He then said to the church at Thyatira, hold fast till I come, referencing the second coming. Then he said to the church at Sardis, I come as a thief. Now, someone tell me why those three verses right there are a complete disproof of Schofield's view. Now, if you think, so think about this with me for a moment. Let's take the first one, Pergamos. Remember when we put Larkin's chart up there? Pergamos was the third phase of the church, Right? Now, what he says in, in Revelation 2.16, I will come unto thee quickly. Can he say that when he's not going to come unto them quickly because there are still four church ages that have to happen? Right, isn't that right? See, the, the, the Schofield view, and this is a good time to say it, I call it the Schofield view. It's a view that Schofield held. And I'm not saying this to say Schofield's a bad guy and we should call him names and make fun of him. He did a lot of great things to advance an understanding of the Word of God. But he, like any other man, is fallible. And so you can't just... You know, one of the things that happens sometimes is when you find a teacher that's good, like Schofield was, people then mindlessly believe everything that he said. And one of the things that it's, it's our duty to do as Bereans is to search the Scriptures, keep the good leave the bad, right? So I just, just to be clear, I'm not mocking Schofield or anything like that, but, but what I am saying is his view on Revelation 2 and 3 is wrong. What Schofield is saying, just to make sure we're really clear on this, he's saying these hundred of years or 200, however many there are, because some of his church ages are quite long, this is the Ephesus age, and then you leave this, and then you're in the Smyrna age, and you leave that, and you're in the Pergamos age, and the Pergamos one is the third one. And what he just said, what, what, what John just said in, in Revelation 2.16 is, Behold, I come unto thee quickly. But, but, but he's not coming quickly if Schofield's right because there's hundreds and hundreds of years of church ages left. Now, by the way, think about this. If Schofield's right that there are phases of the church age, he could only talk about the second coming to the last church. Because any of the earlier ones, telling them about it would be, there'd be no point. Because they know he's not coming because there's future church ages that have to happen. So it seems to me just those three verses, if you had nothing else, if you just have those three verses, they are a complete disproof of Schofield's view. Because how can he talk about coming quickly to a church that he has no intention of coming to at all? Let me just make sure the point's clear. 
There will be no one in the Pergamos church alive when he comes. Right? Because they'll have died hundreds of years before. So I think that's a disproof of, of, of Schofield's view. Look with me then at Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. Now this is said to the church in Thyatira, which is the fourth church in order in, of the different so-called phases. Revelation 2, 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So what he's saying there is, look, if if you guys don't repent, I'm going to cast you into the great tribulation. The term great tribulation only appears in three verses in the Bible. One is in Revelation 2.22. Let's look at the two others. So get Revelation 7. Revelation 7 Verse 14, Revelation 7, verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And this is a question about the saints that are dressed in white. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now get with me Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is the third place that the term great tribulation appears. Let's start Let's start in verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place Whoso readeth, let him understand. Verse 17 is clearly a reference to Daniel 9, the abomination that maketh desolate. That is set up when? The middle of the 70th week, right? So Daniel's 70th week, the last seven years of, of, uh, of Daniel's prophecy to be fulfilled there. In the middle of that week, the abomination of desolation is set up. That's the exact event in verse 15. Now notice verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So what verse 16 tells you is that should people flee at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week? And the answer to that plainly is is no. What they do is they wait until the abomination of desolation is set up. In other words, the man of sin goes into the temple and declares himself to be God. And at that point, they flee into the mountains. Now notice verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation. Now, do you see how that just defined the term for us? The great tribulation does not start at the beginning of the 70th week. It starts when one event happens. The abomination of desolation is set up. What that tells you is the great tribulation is the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. So with that as context, so we know now what the great tribulation is. It's the last half of Daniel's 70th week. Now go back to Revelation 2 just for a minute. Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. Now, as a reminder, go up up to verse 18 real quick. And unto the angel of the, the church in Thyatira write. So what we're looking at here in verse 22 is we're looking at something addressed to the church in Thyatira. Verse 22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. So now if you think of the Schofield view, if someone during the time of Thyatira is misbehaving, what God should threaten to do is to cast them into Sardis, right? Because what has to follow Thyatira is Sardis. And if he says, I'm going to cast you in the great tribulation, the reasonable response would be, not for hundreds of years you're not, right? Right? Because they got to get all the way through Sardis, and they have to get through Philadelphia, and they got to get through Laodicea. And, and, and my point I'm, I'm just making is you, you just cannot reconcile Schofield's view that what these are is these are phases of church history, because the, then all these verses where he's saying things to the church as warnings, they're meaningless. 
because they're just not going to happen. And so, of course, we know that nothing in the Word of God is meaningless. It means the Schofield framework is incorrect. So let's move to the, the third section. So hopefully I've been able to convince you or show you from those verses that Schofield's view of Revelation 2 and 3 is wrong. They're not phases of church history. It has nothing to do with the body of Christ. But then the question becomes, well, what is it? Obviously, it's something. Get Revelation 1, if you would. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1, 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Look at verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. So the first thing I would mention to you simply is this. The seven churches described in Revelation 2 and 3 were actual churches that were in Asia at the time when John was writing it. So they were churches that existed at that time. Now let's just go through and understand some of the things about the specific commandments that were given. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So it talks here about overcoming. Let's make sure we understand what that is. Get with me 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. When the word overcome is used in Hebrews to Revelation, I think it has a very specific reference. I'll show you the verses and you can decide whether or not that's true. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome, notice, the wicked one. When the word overcome is used, it is a reference to overcoming the wicked one. Look with me, you're in 1 John, look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, And that wicked one, what does it say? Toucheth him not. So what we know so far about this wicked one is that believers have to overcome him. And what they also, what happens when they overcome him is what happens is the wicked one toucheth him not. Well, what is that? And what I would suggest to you, obviously it's the mark of the beast, right? Right? When people during the Great Tribulation are confronted with the issue of whether or not they take the mark, they take the mark as an act of worship to the beast. And those that overcome, the wicked one toucheth him not. You're in 1 John chapter 5. Look at verses 4 and 5. By the way, this this here is instruction on, on what to do if you are alive during the Great Tribulation, which none of you should be, right? So if you're alive on the earth today, don't end up in the Great Tribulation. You have the ability to control this. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, think through those there because I think that's actually very helpful. When you read 1 John, just a a fascinating book, in 1 John 4, it tells you to try the spirits. And what it tells you in trying the spirits is to, to test them as to whether or not they believe what? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Because the basic issue during that time is there'll be one of two things that people believe about Jesus Christ. They'll either believe that he's already come in the flesh at the time of the first coming, offered himself a sacrifice for sins. Those folks, according to verse 5, they believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. And if they have faith in that, you know what will happen? 
the wicked one will toucheth him not. Because if they have that faith, they won't take the mark, they won't be damned. But the folks that have that wrong, in other words, the folks that pick the wrong Christ, what the wrong Christ is going to do, the man of sin, the son of perdition, he goes into the temple, and what does he say? I'm here. That's what 2 Thessalonians 2 calls strong delusion. That's what Matthew 24 says, that the deception will be so great that if possible, it would deceive even the, the very elect. Because it's so compelling, it's, it's so persuasive. Now, what's going on here is that, in, go back to Revelation 2.7 if you would. When it talks about overcoming here, it's talking about people having the faith to believe the true thing about Jesus Christ and hence not be caught up in the deception that exists. L- let me share one thing with you. This is a, something I read a while ago that, this story has just, it, it's just fascinating. So maybe this is a fable, so maybe you shouldn't pay attention, and it won't bother me if you zone out. Um, but the, so a rabbi in Israel was being interviewed, and the question that was put to him was the following. The most zealous supporters that you have in the United States are evangelical Christians, which, by the way, is a true statement. And they think that you are fundamentally wrong about the Messiah. And so the question they put to the rabbi was, how do you feel about the fact that your most zealous supporters think you're fundamentally wrong? And that is, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because it is the fact that evangelical Christians are the greatest supporters of Israel, and they do believe Israel is wrong about the Messiah. And what the rabbi said was, it's no worry. When he shows up, we'll just ask him, are you coming the first time or the second? And what's terrifying is I think that's probably a real mindset that exists. Hey, if you don't understand, just ask a question. But if you ask a question to the man of sin, he might not tell you what's true, right? And that, unfortunately, is the way that a lot of history is going to play out, I I, I unfortunately believe. Okay? So in Revelation 2, 7, when it talks about him that overcometh, realize that that is a very clear reference to those during the Great Tribulation believing in the true Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. Go back to Revelation 2 and look at verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. Now just think for a moment. What Schofield's reaction to Revelation 2 and 3 was to make it about the church age. If Revelation 2 and 3 is about the church age, then Galatians 3.28 is relevant. For there is neither, there's neither Jew nor Greek, right? Is there an advantage to being a Jew during the dispensation of grace? Not at all. But in Revelation 2, there apparently is an advantage in being a Jew because people say that they are Jews. Look at chapter 2, verse 26. And he that overcometh, we see that again, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. What's that a reference to? Well, look with me at Isaiah chapter 49. To him will I give power over the nations is obviously a reference to the promise given to Israel that they would be head over all the nations. Isaiah 49, verse 22. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. When you read that prophecy, isn't that amazing? Isn't the story of the dispensation of grace, the Gentiles' hatred of the Jew? I mean, if you objectively look at the dispensation of grace, isn't that what it's about? I mean, how else do you explain Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, persecution of the Jews in India, around the world, There are nations in the world that agree on nothing but that they hate the Jew. 
Isn't that true? That's completely true. That prophecy in Isaiah is that there's a point in time where God brings things, and it is so different from today, where then Israel has control over the Gentile nations, and the Gentile nations value Israel. Well, that's what Revelation 2 is talking about. That's not, that has nothing to do with the dispensation of grace. Go to Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, you you can agree with this, you can disagree with it, okay, it's fine by me. I don't think the book of life has anything to do with the body of Christ, and so you can disagree if, if you want. Let me ask you this, is your name written in a book today such that it can be blotted out? Are there, in fact, people in Scripture whose names are blotted out of the book of life? There are. Can that happen to a member of the body of Christ? No, it can't. Look with me at Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 27. Now, this is a reference to the New Jerusalem. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only ones that enter into the New Jerusalem are the ones that are written down in the Lamb's book of life. Look with me at Revelation 22, verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now just notice carefully what it says here. He'll take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. And what I would tell you is those two things there are equated. In other words, the way you get into the New Jerusalem, the membership role of the New Jerusalem is... The book of life, which has nothing to do with us because are you destined for the new Jerusalem or are you destined to be blessed with, in fact, are you already, blessed with all spiritual blessings in, in heavenly places? Your destiny is not the new Jerusalem. Get Revelation 3.9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan in which say they are Jews... Again, there's a Jew-Gentile distinction with these seven churches. Notice verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Well, what happens there is those that overcome are pillars in the New Jerusalem. That's not the body of Christ. So so let me say this to you, and I don't know if you'll agree with this or not. The book of Revelation is focused on the prophetic program. It has very little to nothing to say about the body of Christ. I can find almost nothing in here that's about the body of Christ. The only verse I know of, and maybe someone afterwards will come up and show me a different one, and that'd be fine. Look at Revelation 12, 12. The only verse I know of that that may reference the body of Christ is Revelation 12, 12. This is after Satan is cast out of heaven. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. And people look at that and say, well, the ye that dwell in them is the body of Christ because the body of Christ is in heaven at that time. And I would certainly agree that the body of Christ is in heaven at that time, but there's also other people in heaven at that time that have nothing to do with the body of Christ that rejoice that Satan is cast out. My point just being that Revelation as a book is not about explaining the future of the body of Christ. Revelation as a book is explaining the future of the prophetic program, the future of kingdom saints. It's how the end times prophecy unfolds, and then Jesus Christ sets up his earthly kingdom, and then he sets up the new Jerusalem. And that's what the book is really about. It seems to me a mistake to look for the body of Christ in the book of Revelation. Get Revelation 22. Verse 14, 
Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now look at verse 19 again. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. What I would suggest to you is this. What the book of Revelation fundamentally is about is it is instructions for those living under the prophetic program as to what they need to do to make it into the kingdom and then into the New Jerusalem. And that's what the book is about. It has nothing to do with the body of Christ. It has nothing to do with the history of the church age. It's nothing like that. So what is going on in Revelations chapters 2 and 3 with the seven churches is John wrote to the actual churches that were in existence at that time, and he gave them instructions, and those instructions were helpful for them. But guess what? Will they be helpful in the future after the catching up of the body of Christ when, again, the prophetic program is in place and people need to figure out how to get into the kingdom? And that's what the book of Revelation is about. That's what Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is about. So I've got one more, more thing then, if I could, just take a few more minutes. I want to ask this question and try to answer it. If the Schofield view is so obviously wrong, which it is, why do people believe it? Get Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Now, what does the vast majority of churchianity say that verse is a reference to? Give me four numbers. One, nine, four, eight. Right? Doesn't churchianity look at that verse and say that's 1948? Right? Right? Israel's back in their own land. Ezekiel 36 is being fulfilled. Look at verse 23. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Is that what happened in 1948? The Gentile nation says, oh, praise God. Israel's been returned to the land. We now know that he's the Lord, and we will worship him and do what he says. That's not exactly what happened, right? Look at verse uh, 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Well, has Israel been cleansed from all its idols? What's the very flag? Is the Star of David in the Bible? See, in Acts 7.43, (coughs) pardon me, there's the Star of their God, Remphan, which is, as far as I know, what the Star of David is. There's no six-pointed star that, that Israel's commanded to use as its symbol. But my point is, has Israel been cleansed from its idols? No. Verse 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. See, what's amazing about Ezekiel 36, man has this great desire to see prophecy fulfilled in his midst, right? And so they they take verse 24, and they say, Verse 24 is fulfilled. Well, verse 23, no, not so much. Verse 25, no, not really. Verse 26, not at all. And verse 27, no way. You, but it, it is completely illegitimate. You, you follow what I'm saying? In other words, man's desire to see fulfillment, I don't know if it's that we love the sensational or what, but they view Ezekiel 36, 24 as the fulfillment of prophecy when it could not be more clear from reading the chapter that that has not occurred. I don't know why man likes to find himself in prophecy, but he clearly does. Possibly it's the self-absorption of man to make everything about himself. Maybe it's simply we always want what we can't have. We're just covetous and we always want other things. Maybe it's that it's our materialistic earthly orientation. So what does Israel get? Israel gets a lot of physical earthly blessings, right? And we like those, right? 
what, what, what is this with these spiritual blessings in heavenly places? Those sound far off and distant, right? I need me some of those material blessings now. My, my point is, what I just want you to get is this. The desire of a saint today to be under the prophetic program is nuts. That's a theological term. <laughs> Look with me at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You know how crazy it is as a Gentile to say, I want to be under the prophetic program? That's wanting to be under all that. Strangers from the covenants of promise, aliens from Israel, without hope and without God in the world. You say, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the prophecy program in the future. Well, let me ask you a question. How does the prophecy program in the future, right after the catching up, sound? What happens? You immediately go from a dispensation in which you could have eternal life and eternal security as a free gift in an instant to endure unto the end, Right? When we were in Revelation 7, 14 earlier and talked about the Great Tribulation, those that washed their robes, what did that, what did that have a reference to? That, that's, a, that's a description there of the saints that emerged from the Great Tribulation. And by the way, the saints that make it through the Great Tribulation, what happens to many of them? Well, they're martyred is what happens. So the, the great, you know, I, I said this earlier in a lighthearted fashion, but Today is the day of salvation, right? Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till tomorrow because you could die. Don't wait till tomorrow because you don't want to be on the other side of the catching up, right? Things get a lot, a lot nastier. I'll close with this thought. Man's self-obsession and desire to see himself in prophecy despises the grace of God. I mean, think of it. We live during the time of God's long suffering. We live during the time of, of God's grace to Gentiles. Where in time past, we were without hope and without God in the world. Then God, through our apostle, gave us direct access to the Father, the free gift of eternal life. And what the body of Christ spends a lot of time doing today is wishing for prophetic blessings and being completely unthankful for, for what we have and what God's given us. Praise God that we live in the days of God's long suffering. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to study it together with the saints. We thank you, Lord, for everyone that you've placed into the body of Christ. And we pray, Lord, that we would be diligent ambassadors to spread your word that more people would be in the body of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.